So uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Purdue Engineering uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. This lecture is, today's lecture is uh, hosted by Elmore Family School of Electrical and uh, Computer Engineering. I'm Dan Jiao, Synopsis Professor of ECE and Associate Head for Resource Planning and Management. So many thanks to our distinguished lecturer, Professor Malik from EECS in University of Berkeley, UC Berkeley, who delivered an inspiring lecture this morning on robots that can learn and adapt. Uh, now is a, a panel session of this event. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the moderator of this panel session, Professor Carti uh, Romani. Then Professor Romani is Donna W. Uh, Featherson, Distinguished Professor in Mechanical Engineering. He is also a faculty, uh, a professor in ECE, my department. He is also a professor in Department of Educational Studies. Then he, in addition, he founded two successful companies had 30 patents, many of which were licensed his students. He also encouraged his students and found many successful companies. So as multidisciplinary as one could be, and being an expert in artificial intelligence and human uh, machine interaction by himself, Professor Romani is going to organize a uh, panel that, that engages our distinguished guests uh, multiple uh, faculty representative panelists in multiple departments, uh, audience on campus and online to explore across boundaries and uh, stimulate broad and uh, thought provoking discussions. So let's welcome our distinguished uh, professor, Professor Romani. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. So, um, First, I wanted to give a very short, quick introduction of uh, Professor Malik. Uh, and and uh, not only is an uh, excellent researcher, but also has won teaching awards, excellence in teaching awards, and member of uh, all the National Academies of Engineering Science and also the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, more importantly, um, he has done a lot of very pioneering work. Some of them that stand out to me in particular are normalized cuts and shape context, which tie to some portions of what we are going to talk about, the, the um, vision side and also the robotics talk was very inspiring uh, to all of us. Uh, and some of the recent work that um, I particularly paid attention to was the 3D post tracking and the uh, earlier model on object rotation with robot hands. Also, I wanted to thank all my colleagues here, uh, David, Dan, Aniket, Chung, and Joy. Uh, and uh, also to uh, Professor Jeff Siskin, who was the instigator of many of the events happening today for this nice framing of uh, what the panel is going to be uh, doing. So uh, with that, what I would like to do is uh, the first 20 or 25 minutes, I'm going to pair um, each of uh, my colleagues with uh, Professor Malik, and there'll be like a three to four minute um, discussion on each of those questions. And uh, that'll sort of frame everything to the audience. And then the rest half, um, what we'll do is we'll have all of you participate and ask uh, questions. So. Don't mind uh, challenging anybody. This is an open territory uh, in terms of what is going on. But uh, first to sort of frame the overall um, overall direction of the panel. I mean, language certainly is a powerful tool for describing and reasoning and so on uh, about a lot of things, perhaps uh, much more uh, than what we can do. Um, but also uh, vision and robotics is, uh, had had a lot of attention in the past. And more importantly, uh, in the last uh, several weeks, uh, we have had increased attention to chat GPT. But more importantly, even more important perhaps is uh, what got released yesterday by Facebook. And one of my students in the audience, we were playing around with it um, earlier today, uh, segment at scale, sort of very much related to uh, what Professor Malik has done earlier. So language uh, and semantics on the one side, but also the other side, the vision and the physical world that we live and work in and uh, robotics role. So framing that in that perspective, what I would like to do is uh, sort of start with um, start with a with a with a question uh, to my uh, colleague David. 
Uh, David uh, does a lot of research in probabilistic uh, understanding and has got a machine learning lab um, in a very uh, open mind. So David, uh, my question to you is, what can we expect with natural language and vision working together uh, at large scale, or are we seriously limited in uh, any different uh, many ways? Right, so uh, I guess, I don't know if I have a full answer to that, but I have uh, two, two points I thought would be useful in this. Uh, one is kind of from a philosophical viewpoint, one's a practical. So philosophically, to some extent, um, I think language uh, has the ability to convey much more rich semantics um, than say vision or images. So try to write, uh, for example, try to write a research paper with only images. Uh, I think you'll find it very, you can't use captions, you can't use labels. It'll be very hard to convey meaning with just images. On the other hand, um, images, uh, you know, if you're trying to describe a missing person, uh, they have more precision. You can just show them a picture of a missing person and everyone can then find them as opposed to trying to describe every little detail of the person. Um, so I think they have very, uh, different ways from the uh, philosophical viewpoint, they might have different kinds of information. And then from a practical viewpoint, I think the data sets are very different. Uh, so, so natural language has incorporated in it um, causal ideas, causal notions we use because, you know, all the time when we're explaining things. Um, and so there's, and there's logical reasoning in language already built into the, the data sets, of course, that we have, or people have already used logical reasoning. And that's not in vision, in, you know, explicitly. Uh, in robotics, it might be built into, say, the simulations, uh, things we understand causally about the world, but in language, it's already kind of there, already in the data. And so I think that would also make a big difference in terms of the differences between the types of data or kind of the qualitative differences of the data sets that we have. Yeah, so, so I think two key points are coming um, from, from your uh, points of view. One is that language is much more richer than vision, at least as uh, computer vision sees it today. Uh, but also your other point uh, touched upon causality, the why uh, question of um, understanding the real world. So maybe, uh, Professor Malik, can you comment on um, you know, your, your um, um, lot of insights into robotics on the one hand, but also uh, human perception and, and uh, vision on the other side? Um, what do you think are the big chunks uh, of missing blocks in terms of maybe even getting to some level of um, accomplishment in terms of uh, robotics and vision that LLMs are capable or endowed today? Okay, uh, so maybe I'd, I'll start by making a comment on vision and language because I think this is uh, worth uh, making. So there's a difference between how children acquire their understanding of the visual world and language and how LLMs do. So in the case of children, they start out with, uh, with obviously with vision, but also with accompanying language given from their parents and siblings and so on. So the, uh, if you look at the process of language acquisition, the, the words that children acquire in their first one, two, three years they are all very concrete words. Dog, milk, bottle, mother, hungry, things like that, right? Which are very, which for which you can imagine a, a person, place, thing, action. Very, it's all very concrete. Okay. And then they start going to school and then they start to read. And then their vocabulary grows, they read books, and then they, they acquire uh, the meanings of words in context and so on. And then they learn words like justice, or peace, or uh, fairness, or things like that, right? Uh, so there is, a, uh, there is a point at which the, what they are acquiring is just through language. But there's an early stage where the language is grounded very much concretely in physical objects or physical actions. And there are these beautiful curves of if at the age of five, their vocabulary is mostly concrete. And at the age of uh, 15, it is many more abstract words than concrete words. Okay. Now, what these LLMs have is meaning acquired in this way, which is based on uh, uh, 
relationships or words to each other. I mean, it connects to this theory called conceptual relationship theory for meaning that uh, you can think of them as arbitrary symbols. It's the relationships which give meaning. And, and that's what is, uh, and, and of course, in that sense, language is like a reflection of the world. So lots of things are about the world which show up in language. And then they show up in, the, uh, and then that's what is being used by chat GPT or GPT-4. So my, uh, I want to really end with a question, which is what can we achieve without grounded language, which is what LLMs have? What will be, for what will grounded language be needed? Now, of course, I think that we have grounded languages coming. So grounded language is there in, when you have, we have these models like clip and blip and all that. And then like the segment, anything, I, you can imagine over the next couple of years, models to emerge such that from any image, you will be able to say, what's every object in it, and you'll know the boundaries of it. So, but then I want to see a link between that understanding, which a two, three year old has into the rest of the language model. And that to me is like a research question because I don't think anybody has shown that yet. It seems uh, it's much easier to teach a robot than a human. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two three years versus your robot learning at yeah. no time in simulation. Um, so you know, I would be curious uh, how we can make humans learn faster. Uh, but coming back to our, uh, our points of view, um, so uh, uh, I want to um, ask Dan to make some comments on on. Uh, your uh, ways of thinking. Um, you do a lot of work in natural language and real world uh, scenarios, especially to guide NLU. So from your point of view, um, talking about mental states and morality and the social side of language, what do you think are the big limitations and differences um, in terms of use of language in the physical world with human beings versus machines? Uh, so. Uh, so I guess my answer would very much echo what we just heard. Uh, it's, in my opinion, kind of hard to think about language understanding uh, without somehow mapping it into the real world, right? Language is a mechanism used to communicate. It's there to influence our relationship with other people, to manipulate objects in the world in response to commands. And right now, these large language models define the meaning of language as more language, which somehow seems to miss on the communication goal. Uh, if you think, want to think about an example, the answer to can you pass the salt is not yes. It's this movement with salt in your hand, right? Uh, in the kind of work that I do, and this is specifically in the context of a recent DARPA project, we try to analyze uh, social situations, acro specifically across cultures, and we want to understand if people are offended or did we somehow acted in the wrong way. So this is a very smart conversational agent that can take this kind of social cues. And one of the things that we notice is that language is really not enough. Uh, our version of, you know, passing the salt or sort of pragmatic and representation of the world requires to understand, well, maybe it's not what you say, but what is the context, the social context in which you are, right? So you would act differently in a business negotiation or around your group of friends. You might, be, you might be more formal with your extended family or with just your mom and dad. And having information that helps contextualize language is really crucial. Um, so I guess like thinking about what would be the next generation, like GPT-7, I don't know. Uh, I think that there are two big research questions that I think it should deal with. The first one is how to augment the representation that language uses such that it identifies prominent aspects in a scene, a video, or real, like a real world scenario. Uh, the second aspect is how do we derive supervision that can help guide our language understanding? For example, in the context of the stuff that, we, that we're working on right now, uh, from somebody who looks upset, which is an easy supervision signal to get from an image or from a vision system, is a very strong cue that we've probably used the wrong language, right? And you could also think about uh, where a person is looking at as a way to contextualize the space of things that they're going to talk about. 
thank you for your comments. Um, maybe, uh, Jitendra, maybe you can comment on uh, connecting some of the issues that uh, Dan has brought up uh, in terms of your recent work uh, in, in um, learning from internet videos. And, and uh, also you talked early, earlier today about the kitchen and uh, how far are we away from teaching robot context and social cues and ability to interact with uh, uh, humans in terms of uh, all those uh, new things that we want them to do? Yes. Uh, so I, I think, uh, I feel that language is a shadow of the world, but it is not the world, right? Uh, and and this is why the excessive reliance on LLMs doing everything is problematic. Because, yes, the world gets reflected into language and the text uh, that we can train our systems from. But uh, it's obviously missing grounding, which I think that problem will probably get fixed. But, it, but there are more aspects, I, I think that as uh, he referred to just recently, but uh, theory of mind, I mean, do we need to have an explicit uh, modeling of that? Uh, do we need to have a modeling of uh, just physics uh, of the world, right? So as every human being, we have, we have a basic uh, sense of, you know, objects fall, break, et cetera, et cetera. And that's different from saying that an ob a glass will break. An LLM will know that a glass will break, but does an LLM really know what a glass that a glass will break? Because that observation of you know something falling and shattering into pieces and and so on, whereas a rubber ball will jump. So this, uh, so in a sense, we uh, we we care. Oh, sorry, yeah. So we care about. Uh, so what's fundamentally important is the world, and language is a shadow of the world. And uh, so I believe that we should get to the world and language is an adjunct. So uh, therefore I believe that the right, that eventually we want to learn from video. So, uh, so there is, uh, in fact, I looked this up recently, there's 156 million hours of video on YouTube. Okay, if I convert this to seconds, it comes down to about half a trillion, half a trillion uh, tokens, if you regard, one second as a token. This is not that far off from the amount of uh, language that was used for training these GPT models. It's actually on the same order, half a trillion. Okay, but what would it? What would the video have which language won't have? It will have this behavior of the physical world, the behavior of dogs and cats and uh, chairs and uh, and how people sit in chairs and how people slice onions. And, and so forth. And I think that uh, ultimately we should be learning from that. Now the technology for that is, is not quite there because in language we start with a token already. In uh, images or video, we'll have to convert it to something and then, and then on top of that build the models. And that conversion process is complicated. Now in my group, we do work on this. We, Try to, we can take videos and we can detect the people and we can lift them to 3D and we can uh, see if uh, somebody is manipulating some object and try to learn uh, robot behavior from that. But it's going to take a little bit of time. But ultimately, my goal would be instead of learning from text or instead of just learning from text, also learn from video. And then we should be able to answer questions like, if you've seen this movie, Casablanca, you have to answer the question of why did Ingrid Bergman leave uh, rather than stay in Casablanca, right? If you want an answer to that question, uh, and, uh, you know, how are you going to get that? I think that needs both. So. Thank you for your comments and especially um, uh, 2D, uh, 3D, and then with uh, or without depth into 3D, and then the video understanding and description and so on at scale. Um, but just as a point of view, I believe uh, the GPT used about uh, 0.6 terabytes and uh, the uh, segment everything used uh, 11 terabytes. Uh, but of course, the features and everything are different. Yeah. Uh, so you are kind of uh, 
starting to see these large language models from, from uh, companies starting to drive a lot of our thoughts here. Um, so Anikit, maybe you can, um, you know, your, your research is on intelligent design of uh, augmented systems and effective systems in AI. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, having thought about uh, robot and locomotion. Um, and, and can you talk about, are there connections where um, LLM kind of um, ideas can be applied to um, learning path planning and locomotion for um, robotics at scale? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot of, um, and, and sort of extending a lot of things already discussed uh, in this panel. I'm, I'm at a point where so many things have already been discussed. How do I extend that mm -hmm. to something which hasn't been spoken so far? So uh, we do a lot of this human robotics interaction for different applications. Um, so like path planning uh, or, you know, robots trying to go to a certain position, trying to uh, understand the environment around it. Uh, so far, a lot of this work has been about visually trying to model the environment. Okay, there's a space next to me. This is where I'll go. Uh, as we're bringing in more humans into this collaborative space in order to solve these problems, there will be more interactions with, with the robots themselves. And as in with any interaction, there is bound to be more conversational interaction, more visual interaction. So this multimodal way of understanding the world, I think, uh, you know, human-robot interaction, human-robot collaboration, teaming, these kind of uh, areas would really leverage from A, these large-scale language models. But I think beyond just LLMs or, you know, right now we are using large models, so to speak, uh, whether it be trillions of videos on YouTube or large language repository, um, or even the way you interact. I keep on giving this example in my class or in this research that uh, human conversation is way more than just text language or whatever you see as an output to chat GPT or you know, these LLMs. Um, one of the projects we are working on is building these robots, therapy-like robots with, with, with um, you know, therapist robots with, with our medical schools here um, is, let's say you were to ask a question to your friend, how are you feeling today? Now your friend might answer the question saying that I'm feeling okay, or your friend might say, I'm feeling okay. These are the same texts in both the cases, right? Uh, if you have an output from, from a system where you are trying to understand just based on text, you would be completely thrown off. The affect or the behavioral space we are trying to infer from, from the other person is almost diagonally opposite. Like uh, one is a very pleasant, happy state and the other one is, I think this person needs some help, <laughs> right? Um, so in order to understand the world better from a robotics point of view, uh, understanding the world, navigation, locomotion, or even better interaction, um, you know, can be, we've been always looking at these problems of can we trust the robot, but we also need to understand the reverse question. Can the robot trust a human uh, based on the interaction? There's so much beyond language that we need to bring in multimodal aspects in this edge uh, human robot interaction space in order to meaningfully solve uh, the next generation of problem. And when I say robots, essentially, uh, I mean agents, which could be uh, graphical, you know, avatars or characters, or at the same time could be physical robots, which are able to solve certain tasks in, in, in the real world. Thank you for your comments. Uh, maybe Jitendra, you can you can uh, uh, make a segue between uh, what is being said to some of your work earlier uh, today uh, in terms of can robots start learning at scale, um, and if so, how that can be, and also this physics that you brought in a simple bouncing ball um, and and being able to understand that from videos, can that be connected to a real ball bouncing and a robot uh, catching it? Okay, so, so I think uh, one way of putting it is ask not what the robot can do for you, ask <laughs> what you can do for your robot. Okay, so uh, I, I, that, I think that's actually, I, but I'm not being facetious. I think this is very important. Eventually, for the robots to help us, first we need to help them. Uh, so the process of robot learning, I feel, has two components, and this is inspired by what we know about how children learn. 
there is a part of it which is very private and personal based on your own experience in your own body, right? Because the child, I mean, uh, is exploring the world. She is uh, looking at a ball, putting things into her mouth, throwing things, doing experiments. Uh, there's a book called Scientists in the Crib referring to children. Through that, they get a sense of their own body, the hand-eye coordination and so on. And so like our walking robots are sort of in that phase. But that is not the only way we acquire knowledge, right? I mean, human beings can go to the moon, okay? You didn't, one person would not be doing trial and error to go to the moon. It is the result of our culture. What And culture is not just in the last uh, 10, 20 years, culture goes back 100,000 years when we first, some humans figured out how to light a fire and then transferred the trick to the next generation. So there is culture is the transmission of knowledge, right? From generation to the other, from parents, from siblings, from everywhere. So anyway, long story short, so much of what we can do mechanically in manipulation is not done by raw trial and error, but you learn by observing others. So I think that this is what, in my view, robotics will be. 10% is what you'd learn for yourself. 90% is what you learn by observing humans. And so my joke is, not, is actually quite serious. You will, the robots have to learn. And for this, the underlying technology is analysis of video. And, uh, and our computers today are terrible at it. So I think of this as like, we talk about IQ and EQ, right? Emotional intelligence, social intelligence. Our computers are pathetic. They need to be able to do the things that you want that therapist to do, right? Which is that you see somebody and you know whether they are despondent or jubilant. Yeah. And, 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 and we'll get there. But, but this has to be uh, uh, foregrounded. This has to be a central problem we all work on. And personally, my work in computer vision, I worked on many different things in the past. But at this point, what I'm totally focusing on is, uh, is uh, perception of humans. Yeah, thank you. Very nice uh, segue to bring uh, Joy into the conversation. So um, your work has been on designing novel machine learning models to improve interoperability, fairness, and robustness. But also, uh, you have some uh, interest in in the in the uh, medical uh, robotics kind of space. So maybe you can comment a little bit more about um, what are the types of applications that you start seeing. Uh, should we be able to bring language and vision together um, in in new ways? Right. So. Any concerns um, or other uh, issues that you want to raise regarding it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, so, as the like panel has broadly discussed about the like vision versus language, and also as um, Professor Malik has mentioned that uh, language is uh, like a shadow of the word. So, meaning that using only language uh, for uh, for the uh, robots to understand the physical world is not enough. So definitely like uh, multi-modality, like bringing variant data into consideration, like doing integration between variant data and language data. So that will be a definitely good idea for the robots to better understand the, uh, the physical world. And also we can get better interaction with the machine so that uh, we can learn how the robots can help us and also we, how we can help the robots. Uh, so uh, one, in my opinion, as we mentioned, like uh, uh, Vera and language data, they are playing different roles. Uh, so language data will be definitely good at summarizing the high level abstract concepts. Uh, but uh, on, uh, like in contrast, uh, Vera data will be good at summarizing or uh, conveying information in a more intuitive way especially if we, if we want to describe things in a concrete or specific idea. So for example, if we want to uh, direct the direction from one location to the other location, then if we describe that in language, then that would take uh, things inefficient because we need to describe, we have to go along certain streets for certain miles uh, when you see the second uh, stop sign, turn right, something like that. But if we can have a map, then all we need to do is just draw a route on that. And then things can be conveyed more precise and clear and neat. 
So based on this, I think integration of this multimodality data is actually what people are doing. ChatGPT is allowing like multimodality inputs, allowing not only text inputs, but also image, video inputs, so that we can get better interaction. And in terms of the applications, uh, based on my own research, I work in like uh, healthcare medical applications. So people are like doing a lot of brilliant ideas. For example, people can use that for disease surveillance and provide virtual assistance. Uh, to patient care. And then by integrating such multi-modality, so uh, the machine can not only see the text, like describing the certain profiles, but they, they can also see maybe the video and images of the patient and learn much better about the patient status and then give uh, like appropriate and tailored precise recommendation treatment to them. So those are the uh, like ideas we can support. Uh, as for concerns, as, as we get powerful tools that uh, there are definitely concerns for, for me related to my research, I work in trustworthy AI. So I would definitely have concerns about if the model are using appropriately, if the model is making, maybe uh, replicating some stereotype, making biased, uh, biased decisions in high stake areas. Uh, and uh, if people from maybe, because this tool is bringing so much power and so much resource, are people from different maybe geographic locations or different areas getting similar access to this powerful tool? So those are the like fairness concerns we may have. And also we may have maybe uh, concerns about data leakage uh, like uh, issue or privacy concerns. But I would say that all those concerns are opening up the new research directions. So it doesn't mean that we should just stop use this model, but rather we should be using this model by using that in an appropriate way. So we should learn how to use this model better so that they can better uh, like uh, serve our life. And also we can also be better help the model and then based on the better interaction and use of with caution. So we can use that to make the human's life to, to be better. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Um, earlier today, Jitendra, you made this uh, comment on technology going at uh, breakneck speed and also uh, to some extent, um, you, were, you were supporting that, uh, perhaps maybe I'm right or wrong, uh, but also we all like theory. Uh, what is your uh, feeling of many of the issues that, uh, you know, we as researchers, uh, uh, interpretively fairness, robustness, and many other things that we are concerned about versus how fast technology is going and uh, our ability to have any say in it as researchers? Uh, do you think it's decreasing or how do you see that evolving? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I, first of all, I think uh, the concerns that you expressed about, uh, you know, the whole area of responsible AI is very important. And uh, I think it, it is getting more and more prominence. I think what I see is like, like 10 years ago, nobody would have cared about it, but people today care a lot, both in academia and in industry. So that's a step in the right direction. That doesn't mean that we have solved it. And I think, uh, when we, and we are making moving so fast that the problems are only increasing. Uh, so I don't have any uh, special insights into this as to how to uh, how uh, I think that uh, there's a role for everybody in the sense that I think there is some role for government. Uh, there is some role for university ethics boards, like uh, collecting data. I mean. So uh, let's take an example of medicine, right? Once upon a time, you just did an experiment, but now you can't do that, right? There's a review board and you people weigh uh, issues of privacy, harm, possible benefits. I mean, it, and, and there are trade-offs to be made, but we've sort of decided that that is important rather than just, you can go and do whatever. Uh, so I think that that, is that perspective has to be brought to bear. We are becoming too important to behave like kids. I think in the old days, we could behave like kids because nobody, it didn't matter, but we have become too important. We meaning collectively the, the AI type community and uh, that brings greater responsibility. We cannot play with matches anymore. Okay. Uh, that's uh, I, I think a, a, a high level view, but I, I acknowledge the, the need, but I don't have any extra insight than anyone, uh, anyone else. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you for your comments. Um, so, um, Chiang, uh, your, a lot of your work is on 
image understanding and representation, but also uh, earlier uh, you showed a lot of interest and had opinions on role of uh, universities in this new and emerging areas, especially uh, uh, in terms of a lot of the generative uh, aspects that we are starting to see becoming quite powerful. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that um, in, in the context of application. Okay, yeah, thank you. So this is a question I think that we all care, but I, I don't think I also want to know the, the actual answer. So I just try to initialize uh, the discussion. So I think that uh, all story have two sides. Uh, I think since we are all very excited about chat GPT, so I will start with the, the maybe the discouraging side. So it's very expensive to train large model, we all know. And I don't see the official uh, numbers, but uh, looks uh, somebody quote like 4.5 millions to train the, chap uh, the GPT-3, uh, maybe much more expensive to, tra to train the uh, GPT-4. Uh, and uh, I think that in, uh, in the research area, we are all using this uh, stable diffusion. Stable diffusion is a more economic way, uh, but they still say it's a point, uh, point 0.5 million to train from scratch. Uh, so for a regular researcher in university, those are kind of expensive. So we probably we don't afford to that. Um, lately, I see most of the research in university, uh, maybe in the past several months, more surrounding like how to fine tuning those models, of course, there's a lot of the elegant work like control net, uh, text inversion. They are very beautiful. Yeah, but from that uh, expensive training perspective, I think that uh, we probably the contribution from the university maybe will be limited slightly. Um, but the good side, the exciting side is uh, to, uh, in my opinion, I think that this language, large language model perspective um, allow us to revisit every single uh, vision task. For example, in the in this morning, I was reading this uh, uh, Facebook this uh, uh, segment. Everything actually, I read the paper. I right away sent to all my students. I feel this basically redefined the uh, segmentation. Uh, we we are happy with segmentation, but it looks like this is uh, raised this to a new level. With uh, uh, and also most of the senior members, I think that as uh, Professor Malik's uh, former students. Yeah. Um, so, um, but then again, you may say, hey, this is a large model from Meta. Um, but we, we are doing machine learning. We know machine learning nowadays is more data driven. Uh, so the first question is where does those data come from? I feel actually just live with those large models also give an opportunity to say, can we use this generated synthesized data? Uh, can we use those data for something? Uh, I believe that is a, a great opportunity there. Yeah, maybe uh, for example, like this segmentation work opened up my thoughts to say, hey, maybe we can really think about how to learn those visual relationship in an image. Those things are typically lack of data to do that. And also I believe most of the university researchers are capable, are highly capable. So given the, the barrier uh, of this expensive learning, I believe soon uh, maybe a lot of master will come out to how to disassemble those large models into many small models to learn. I, I, I think probably it's not too far, yeah. Thank you. Do you have any comments on? Yeah, uh, so uh, I think it's a fair uh, point that uh, today uh, research on these very large models uh, has essentially got concentrated in a few institutions. I mean, Google can do it, Meta can do it, OpenAI can do it, Microsoft can do it, but uh, there are probably a bit, few big Chinese labs which can do it, but the number is small. And uh, what does that mean? And what, how should it go forward? So I, I have a couple of points to make there. One is that I think uh, on, in the US at the federal government level, there need to be initiatives to make it possible. And uh, it should, it, we can look at other sciences, for example. So look at the astronomy people. Uh, every university doesn't build their own telescope to send to, the, to outer space. They negotiate, they figure out, okay, we're going to send the Hubble telescope. And they agree, okay, that this is the specifications of this instrument and, and these are the experiments we'll do and then there'll be some individual work, but by and large, the community has agreed on something. Uh, large Hadron Collider, I mean, the Higgs boson, you can't have every university build their own LHC, you have to agree and work together. So similar things should be possible here. So 
four or five million is big when we think of it compared to our NSF grant, but four or five million compared to these astronomers and their telescopes in space is nothing, right? So I think that that's a question of getting organized. Uh, I feel that uh, we need to have a lot of, uh, uh, so I'm arguing for big science basically, but I'm also going to argue for small science. And this is because in the, what happens in the companies is that there is a desire, there's a lot of herding, which is that if somebody wants to do, apply technique A, the other company also wants to do apply a technique A. And everybody wants to go towards the winners because they, uh, they, I mean, lots of money is at stake. I mean, the battle between Google and Microsoft for who controls uh, search and ads related to search. It's a very big battle. I mean, you know, so, uh, I mean, I work for neither of these companies, but I'm, my point is that the stakes are high, which means that you can't take that many risks. You pay, okay. And, uh, but research strives on a uh, on, uh, lot of, there should be a lot of exploration, not just exploitation. And academia does that very well. Okay, so uh, so then, uh, okay, so I'm making that statement as well. So I'm making a statement. So then is there a, can we connect the two? And I think the idea there is that can we democratize the process in some way? So sometimes it could be like that large model from Meta, you will be able to use it, right? So sometimes it can be that uh, there'll be models which are trained, but then they are modified or fine-tuned. And uh, I hope that there will be enough diversity because it really would be very sad if we uh, we limit our uh, our research uh, uh, agenda and if we all do the same thing. Thank you for your comments. I think at this time, um, since we have framed uh, the conversation, I would like all of the audience to start participating. Um, so please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, very exciting panel. Thank you all for your wonderful uh, comments. So I uh, I have two part of my question. Um, I think the first part echoes with some of the discussion about you know trustworthiness and you know uh, you know how to do responsible AI. And I think with any new technology or newish technologies, there's only always two sides, right? One side is oh excited, you know, advocating it, and the other side is oh no no, this is going to take over the world. And I think this is. <laughs> Um, something we're seeing right now, particularly with GTPs and then, you know, some of these very, you know, large capable models, right? Um, so as uh, I think us in academia, uh, what is our role in this? I'd like to hear from our panelists um, and then, you know, how to help move our field uh, forward, um, you know, in these sort of very, you know, biased um, um, you know, both sides of the spectrum. So that's my first question. Uh, and the second question I think is related um, to it in the sense that, um, so throughout the day, we hear a lot, particularly with uh, Professor Malik, about how, you know, children learns um, and then what they observe. And I think a part of it is also, you know, how not only they learn by observing the world, but also, you know, they learn by through their parentings, the character buildings, you know, with their, you know, social connections, um, how they have empathies and so on, right? Um, so I think there is that uh, kind of missing link or gap between how our machine learning learns and then, you know, compared to, you know, our humans. I'd like to hear um, perhaps some opinions from the panelists on this as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, your points are all valid. Uh, I personally, so I want to speak to the first one about uh, should we stop research? So I'm on the side of continuing research. So there was recently a, a petition to sign, uh, which I did not sign. Uh, uh, so that reveals my position, which is that, oh, don't build a G, beyond GPT-4, because I think that's not even a well-formed question. And how will you control it, by the way? I mean, there will always be people who will do it. And what does it mean in different dimensions? I think in robotics, we are not yet at even GPT-0.1, right? So, uh, uh, okay. Uh, second, uh, what can we learn? Uh, I mean, the distinction between how these models are being trained versus how children are learned. That is to me very crucial, but I think people, this is not being paid enough attention to. So for example, 
this thing is learning from the GPT is learning from all the information on the web, which includes lots and lots of garbage, right? Okay, and and then that is embodied in it. It's it, right? So there are these experiments to show that there are all these different personalities which show up, and you know, so there are all these very laudatory articles, but there are also these articles where people have these very weird and scary encounters. So it's like all those personalities, it has, it has the best and worst of humanity. Now, what do we do for kids? Do I take a child of six and expose them to everything on the internet? No, right? So we have, we have some mechanisms in our standard you know, uh, schooling or we rate movies and we say, okay, when you're a kid of this age, you don't watch this kind of movie. We try to restrict uh, access to pornography. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying there's lots of different kinds of controls that society has worked out over time. And uh, I don't know what's the counterpart of that, but but uh, I, I feel that right now we are more like, ah, let's throw in everything. And I, I feel that I personally think that's problematic. because the question was closer to your space. Maybe you can comment as well. Uh, yeah, I'd like to comment mostly on the second question. Uh, I think that there's something really unsatisfying about this, the way these language models are trained right now, which is predict the word that has been artificially taken out. And it builds on linguistic rules and distributional hypothesis, but it misses out on intentionality, on the ability to you know achieve your objectives using language. And with it comes the objective of not upsetting people and not offending them. And so including humans in a tighter way as part of the training loop, I think is crucial. And like with humans would come natural interaction. Can I, can I first? Maybe you want to go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I also have cool questions. Yes, of course I'll thank the panel. Um, so first question is uh, from GPT to currently GPT-4, we can see the trend, like more data, bigger model, better performance. Um, so do you think this trend will continue? Do you think there is an upper limit there? The reason I'm asking because my group has been working on uh, model compression. Um, in certain scenarios, we may want smaller model like energy constraints, resource constraints and so on. So right now we still see quite some big room in the compression, but we have been wondering like, is there an, an upper limit there? <laughs> so that's the first question. Uh, the second question I have is a little bit different in a different space. So it's actually related to education. So there are many students here. Um, so like with chat GPT, so people have been trying it, like writing papers, writing, scientific reports and so on. Um, and I think there is some debate out there, like should we develop some detector to like detect if a report is written by ChatGPT or do you think ChatGPT can become like a new type of calculator, like students should master and should utilize in their future education. So I'd like to know the panelists' opinions on this. Thank you. That was going to be my big closing question part of it, but that's fine. Uh, well, you know, that's fine. I mean, I've been feeding ChatGPT a lot of our uh, standard mechanics and projectile problems. Um, so, so I can talk to you independently about uh, what it does, at least today. Um, and I'm sure every, every one of you has comments uh, there, but certainly a bigger question for all of us, I think uh, maybe uh, Professor Malik can respond. And Berkeley, I'm sure your colleagues are talking about it. Um, GPTX, right? Um, how disruptive, building on your point of view, how, how disruptive uh, is it in particular to computer science education um, and, and things that um, undergrads uh, you know, often taught and do and learn over a period of time? And, and how do you think we can respond? And perhaps all panelists can, can also talk about it. Uh, and especially, uh, you know, it's, it's in some ways intruding into a the way that we think, at least as some parts of it uh, happen now in, in, in classes and so on, like 
uh, things that are taught. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you have some comments on its, um, you know, educational so uh, models. On, on that, I, I, I don't, I, again, I don't have any specific research to put, but I have opinions like everyone else sure. in this room. Sure. So uh, my position, I'm on the side of uh, acknowledging it and uh, incorporating it. And uh, I would think of it in the following way. If you look at the history of programming from 1950 to 60 to 70, it has always been in the direction of abstraction and higher level uh, communication of control. Once upon a time, uh, machine language was, uh, I, have, I learned programming in like 1976 and I have programmed a machine with paper tape and by pushing buttons on 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 a, on a so first you had to load a program which would load this paper tape and i entered that program by pushing a few buttons and then it loaded the binary tape and then it something and something we don't need to do that right it's not that but uh, in teaching uh, at least at berkeley we still have a class where people have to learn computer architecture and machine language Though they're never going to program in it, 99.99%. Then there's a stage where you program in, you know, uh, Pascal or Python or Java or whatever. And then there is a stage at which you program in ChatGPT, okay? And I, all of those are valid. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, similar things happen in computer graphics. I mean, you're using OpenGL versus you know how to write a rendering engine yourself. I, th I think that this is, uh, your, it's Luddite to try to uh, fight that, but make people understand each of the stages. And then you can have exams which are appropriate to that. So like calculators, right? I mean, if your kid is in fifth grade, she needs to learn how to multiply without a calculator, right? I think schools can solve that problem. Why can't we solve the problem that for certain exams, they cannot use chat GPT and for certain other things, if their software engineering productivity is improved by chat GPT, how are you going to hold it back? Did that answer your question partly? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah. The first question, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, the upper limit. This one is, we don't know. This is a research question. But I have, my speculation is that, uh, that uh, yes, there will be bigger. There is as much space at the top as there is at the bottom. So that means both are needed. So if I think of brains, I'll use biology as an example. Insects, like a fly, has a million neurons. Okay, so 10 to the 6. The human brain has 100 billion neurons. So 10 to the 11. Okay, these networks have parameters which are in the trillions, right? 10 to the 12. Okay, uh, that fly is amazing in terms of what it can do. Uh, if you look at the data that a child takes, a child learns, basically a million words a month. That's the kind of data for a child being exposed to language. So if you take the data over 20 years, it's like a factor of 1,000 less than what's being trained. So my guess is that over time, we will see all of these points. So there will be space at the bottom and at the top. Um, very interesting panel. Um, so I have a question on um, how... Um, like what you talked about, where babies learn from one of the things being free social. Um, I guess part of it is actually understanding or getting feedback from an expert adult on how to do motor control. Um, so can we adapt something similar um, in the context of robot learning? Um, so for example, we saw like large language models benefited a lot from using like RLHF, where there was evaluative feedback um, on just saying what was a better um, text generation. But for robots, would it benefit to actually model something similar like RLHF, but instead of using an evaluative feedback, we use corrective feedback. So hold the robot's hand and provide a kinesthetic correction. Would that improve robot learning from interactions rather than just having um, learning from a data set, which is just supervised learning, but having human in the loop during the learning from corrective feedback? Um, and I have another question, which is related to like language models. Um, so do language models provide a more orthogonal space to discriminate rather than visual features? So for example, um, if I have a dog or a fox image of them, they might be very similar in visual features, but a dog and the fox, the word itself is like more orthogonal. So if we can, um, is it better to rather 
directly classify from visual features, learn vision to language embedding to do the classification. Um, yeah, those are the two questions. So the, yeah, maybe we should take the first question um, in terms of... The first question, I'll give a very short answer. Yes, yes. Okay, meaning that Yes, this what you're describing should be done. And this is being explored. I think the robotics field is doing like demonstration learning, imitation learning. Then uh, there, this area is becoming quite big and all these variations are being tried and should be tried. Yeah, the second question was more related to alignment. Between Language versus vision. Yeah, so there are so I think that's a point that he made earlier, which is that yeah. there are certain things which are more explicit in language. And I would say, uh, I mean, you know, like there's this thing, a picture is worth a thousand words, but sometimes one word has more than a picture, right? Both are true. So I, I think it's uh, both. I mean, I'll, I'll give, okay, I'll give one, one uh, fun example. Uh, try to teach somebody how to tie their shoelaces just using language. Or try to teach somebody how to climb stairs just using language. You'll find it is difficult. You are not allowed to point. You're, you know, you just have to say, uh, how do you describe the process of tying your shoelaces in language? It's terrible. Whereas visually, it's much easier. Motor, it's even easier. Uh, but then if you want to talk about uh, the the Ukraine versus Russia, and you want to describe the issues there, try doing that with pictures. It doesn't work, right? Yeah, thank you. So um, I have a question on the software programming aspect of these large language models. So as you know, people are trying to generate software code using these models, but it seems like there's a blind spot where the reliability or the security of the code that's being generated by them is still open to question because these models are learning from a preponderance of data. And by definition, security attacks or vulnerabilities, they're very rare events. So do you see this as possibly another blind spot of these kinds of uh, LLMs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think we'll figure it out over time. But I think the person who's, who, somebody should still be responsible. Right, so if I'm using this to generate ideas of code, then I, it's my job to review it. And so this comes down to, if you have a compiler which works well 99.9% .9 of the time, but 0.1% of the time it produces wrong code. In the old days, we would have regarded that as unacceptable, right? So it's somewhat analogous to that. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, sorry, good afternoon. It was a great discussion. We've covered a lot of topics from how a child learns, like a very neuroscience perspective of it. We talked about ethics, trustworthy AI, like programming things about it. So I have a question, like which kind of ties all of this together. Uh, this is something I've been hearing about deep learning in like my limited experience as a graduate student, that the deep learning, the applied part is more going much faster than the theoretic theory can catch up to it. So with the given uh, recent thing in the, like about Twitter going viral, that should we sign this petition to stop language model training? Should we reframe that question as, instead of like not just stop it, but also simultaneously increase our pace at which we are able to explain this, like through explainable AI to get these metrics for our trustworthiness and also catch up with like theoretical explanations. Like a student asks, like, is it just making the space orthogonal? Like should, should as a researcher, like with so much experience, like I'm barely like uh, five, six years of experience, but in your experience, would you think like sh we should increase our pace on this theoretical aspect of it? Well, the theorists should answer this. <laughs> Who's the theorist? You're the theorist. Maybe I'm the theorist. Um, <laughs> I think one of the, especially in the trustworthy space, one of the challenges there is formalizing what is safe or, you know, what is trustworthy. These are concepts, one, that humans don't usually agree on, um, especially when you get into like social sciences. There's whole fields, people studying, trying to say what is justice. People disagree on what justice is. 
So it's like you have to then choose which view of justice you have, and half the people in the room will disagree with your choice of justice. Um, and then so you implement a theory like it's awesome, but no one agrees with your view of it. Um, so I think that's I, I, I end up thinking some of these are more social challenges in, in terms of the trustworthy part. In terms of the theory part, I would say people are probably going to use it no matter if it works, even if they don't have theory about it. So I think that um, I think it would just take a pragmatic view, like even if you can't explain why a rocket goes into space, if it goes into space, you'll still probably use it. Um, so I think people are going to use ChatGPT even though they don't know. And I think explaining it is definitely a, worthwhile in certain applications, but it's just it's just a very hard problem because even explanation, again, gets back to philosophy and this notion of language and how people interpret things, right? People interpret the same sentence differently depending on their background and their... And so you get into even, you know, you know, it can't be solved mathematically in some way. It's a social, it ends up becoming a social problem pretty quickly, I think. So, um, Professor Malik, uh, I had like several thoughts about, you mentioned like the upper limit and like the lower limit. And we, uh, and you discussed like the astronomy people actually have like a single well, the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah. So I think that um, a very like interesting development model for like software that actually comes into the democratized democratization process and like the consensus will be something akin to open source standards, right? Because we have a community that argues the technical merits of a certain idea, and some of the ideas will get sifted out, filtered out. Some of them will get adopted. Some of them will um, evolve into something else. And I think that would be suitable for like machine learning, correct? And also like, I have an idea, I mean, if we look at the fly, like 1 million, well, I forgot the exact number, like 1 million, million neurons. neurons and like our chat GPT has like much more, uh, perhaps it might make sense for us to do something like FPGA, but smaller. So we can just implement our like weights and biases like directly into digital logic instead of having it be passed through some processors with memory and things like that, maybe it might make sense. Uh, sure. I mean, I, 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 I think that all of those ideas will, uh, will, will get explored, I think, over time. Oh, okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Mali. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Civil Engineering. Thank you for all your uh, very interesting discussions. Uh, I was told I'm the last person, so I'll just try to keep it quick. Uh, I'm working on the learning from construction site videos. So I used the segment anything model last night and this morning, and it was right out of the box. And the segmentation on my construction video set was uh, very incredible. So. Uh, with input points uh, collected from previous bounding boxes for um, simpler models, I got a greater output for this. And so I have two parts of my question. First is AI progresses are going so fast. Every year there is a big new thing. At this pace, do you feel it is important for us PhD students to focus on applying some of these progresses towards industry? There is a huge gap in adoption in areas like civil engineering in practice. Um, that is my first question. The second one is uh, extension to one of the other questions. Do you see any new learning mechanisms so that the models don't keep getting larger and larger? So thank you. Yeah, I mean, the adoption part, I think it's going to happen the way all new ideas get adopted. Usually young, younger people such as yourself are always the ones who lead in that, whereas the old fogies will follow. So you should just do what you do. Uh, on the second of uh, this uh, uh, compute energy and so on, as I said, I'm not professionally in that, but I'm an optimist. I believe that uh, the, 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 there are, uh, there's a whole area, right? The SysML, uh, the people who are working on this and there are no fundamental there are no limits like from physics which say, oh, it cannot be done at lower energy. So I would expect that people will keep finding better ways. Uh, I think that I would, I, I start out being optimistic, not pessimistic. Thank you. 
thank you thank you yeah one of my friend was asking like uh, the academic is slower than industry but when compared to like other divisions like civil engineering i feel the adoption in industry is much slower than what is actually happening in the academic so thank you yeah one more question Yeah, so uh, we have seen the great development of this uh, ChatGTP and the uh, general AI. It can deal with a lot of tasks, uh, like including daily, daily tasks and also some specific domain tasks. Uh, so my, my question is, like, should we evaluate this uh, AI model, this maybe ChatGTP model, like as we evaluate AI, uh, some human, like expert or like when human dealing with the same tasks, like like this that's my question well that's what is being done in their all their pr literature right they make it take the sat they make it take the lsat so that's what they do but uh ultimately i mean there's no money to be made by taking the lsat test unless it's to cheat right so uh ultimately it's going to be tested by particular domains and particular applications so this will get sorted out commercially i think that uh, there's always a scientific thing you have to do which is to prove to people in some way that this is significantly more capable than previous work and i think the gpt people have shown that so now then in terms of where to apply it, how to apply it, I think uh, time will tell. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you all uh, all the panelists, David, Dan, Aniket, Chang, Joy, and uh, especially Deependra for having uh, come to Purdue and uh, participated in the panel and also for the wonderful talk in the morning and hope some of the conversations will continue during individual meetings. So with that, thank you uh, to the audience as well for having participated. So we'll just close. Thank the you. Session. Thanks. Yeah.